morning, everybody. Welcome to our Bible study once again this morning. If you've got your Bible there, you might like to turn, if you haven't already, to 2 Timothy and chapter 3. We'll be looking at a few verses there this morning. But let's just pray as we begin our study this morning. Father, we submit to your authority today as we come to study your word. We pray, Lord, that you would teach us. And as you teach us, Lord, help us to take your word help us to apply it in our lives. We thank you for your spirit who strengthens us to both to understand your word and to live it out. We pray that in dependence upon him this morning, that we might be better fitted to serve you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're going to read a few verses from 2 Timothy chapter 3. And uh, we, we started to look at this chapter last week. And we're going to pick it up today actually in verse 14 verse 14 of 2 Timothy chapter 3. Paul writing to Timothy says, But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of, because you know those from whom you learned it, and how from infancy you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is God-breathed, and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. <clears throat> so just a few verses that we have before us today to study, and yet in those verses is perhaps one of the most important, perhaps the most important verse in the whole of the Bible. It's a verse which is absolutely foundational to our Christian faith. If we don't believe this verse, then we have no basis for believing or teaching or seeking to live out any of the other things that are found in the Bible. It's here that we find the authority that we have for taking the Bible seriously and seeking to apply it in our lives. It's the beginning of verse 16 which says all scripture is God breathed. All scripture is God breathed. When we read the Bible, the words that we are reading are the words that God has breathed out. Older translations of this uh, verse have often used words such as uh, all scripture is inspired by God or inspired of God. Perhaps to our modern ears, that might sound a little bit weak. Freddie, my grandson, um, might say that he is inspired by Harry Kane. Freddie aspires to be a great footballer. And uh, like all the men in our family, he supports Spurs. And he looks to Harry Kane and he, as his role model. And as he watches Harry play, watches the amazing goals that he pulls off, Freddie is inspired by him. And he wants to emulate him. He wants to become a great footballer and a great goal scorer, just like Harry Kane. But Freddie's never met Harry, and F uh, Harry has never spoken to Freddie. He's just seen him on the television. He's read a bit about him, uh, but that's as far as it goes. And yet he feels inspired by him. He admires Harry, and he tries to emulate him, but that's as far as it goes. But when we talk about uh, the scripture being inspired by God or God breathed, I think we have to go a bit further than that. Peter, in his letter, writing about the Old Testament writers, says this. He says, though human, they spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. That word carried along has the sense of a ship which is being carried along by the wind, a sailing ship carried along by the wind. What Peter's really saying there is that the Holy Spirit came upon these men and he breathed out God's word through their writings. And so the Bible is no ordinary book. It is the breathed out word of God, and we should never, ever forget that. That's what gives it its authority. If the Bible was written solely by human men, then it has no more value than any other book, any other philosophy. 
It is because although God used men to write these words, through them he breathed out his words, and so the Bible has this unique authority. Now, of course, at the time that Paul wrote these words and Peter wrote similar words, the New Testament wasn't complete. But that doesn't mean to say that the New Testament has any less authority than the Old Testament scriptures that perhaps Paul was thinking of particularly here. It seems that the apostles believed that they were writing scripture in many of their writings. Peter certainly recognised that what Paul had written in, in his letters uh, was scripture. You can find that in 2 Peter chapter 3. Read that later and you'll see that Peter certainly recognised the authority of, of Paul and that he was actually uh, contributing to the full canon of scripture. And Paul knew that what he was teaching had been given to him directly by God. In Galatians chapter 1, he says, I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that the gospel I preached is not of human origin. I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it. Rather, I received it by revelation from Jesus Christ. And later writing to the Thessalonians, he says, when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as a human word, but as it actually is the word of God, which is indeed at work in you who believe. So both the Old Testament scriptures and the New Testament scriptures are part of this whole breathed out word of God. They are the breathed out word of God, all scripture. And Jesus, of course, in his life, he endorsed, didn't he, the, the, the scriptures. He spoke, he, he very often quoted from the Old Testament, which, of course, was the only Bible that had been written at that point in time. His, uh, he said that his life was a fulfillment of those Old Testament scriptures. He really endorsed the authority of the Old Testament. But also, as he, as he spoke to his disciples, he looked forward to the way in which there would be uh, further writings and further teaching to come, and that this also would be directly from God. He told his apostles that the Holy Spirit would teach them all things, would guide them into all truth, and would declare to them the things that are to come. In other words, it seems that Jesus was saying that the Holy Spirit would move on them and breathe out God's words through their writings, just as he had through those Old Testament writers. And so this is the bedrock of our faith, that all scripture, the whole of the Bible, is God-breathed. It has God's authority, and therefore we must take it very seriously. All scripture, it's not that we pick and choose the bits that align with our thinking, the bits that we, that we like to read, we must take the whole of the Bible, all scripture. We must know that it is God's word to us. It is God who breathed these words out. You know, Satan will try to sow seeds of doubt. He'll say, oh, you can't really understand. You can't really believe that bit. Uh, you don't have to take that bit very seriously. And Satan will accuse us and question God's word. But this has always been Satan's tactic, hasn't it? Right at the beginning of time. What did Satan say? Has God said to Adam and Eve? And that's the way in which Satan tries to undermine our faith. But we should not listen to Satan's lies. We should take uh, this word seriously. We must trust God, trust God's word, and come and submit to its authority. But we've dived into the middle of these, these verses, and we need to just back up a little bit to see how we got here. How does Paul come to declare this truth in this letter to Timothy. Well, earlier on in chapter 3, in the first 10 verses, he describes people who have rejected God's truth, who've lived lives without regard to God, and he lists some of the behaviours that result, selfishness, pride, depravity, and so on, uh, a complete godless way of life that result uh, from not uh, attending to God's word. But then in verse 14, the beginning of the passage we're looking at today, he says, but as for you, Timothy, be 
different. Don't be like these people who have ignored what God has said. You be different. Continue to base your life upon God's truth. And he describes it as being what you have both learned and become convinced of. And I think that's an important distinction that Paul makes there, what you have learned and what you have become convinced of. Of course, we need to learn God's truth, don't we? We need to read the Bible. We need to think about it and understand what it says. But, you know, it can be, if we take it no further than that, it can just be head knowledge and have no real impact on our lives. It can just be an intellectual exercise in uh, reading the Bible. We need to learn it, but we also need to be convinced and convicted of its truth such that we take action so that when we read God's word we put it into practice that was the teaching of Jesus wasn't it we it's no point just reading God's word and doing nothing about it we need to base our lives our whole lives upon the truth of God's word so we need to take action put it into practice and Paul gives two reasons why Timothy should continue in what he has learned rather than any other philosophy or way of life. And the first thing he says, it's because of those who have taught him. And he particularly in uh, verse 15 refers back to his infancy, how from infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures. Who were the people who uh, taught him the Scriptures in his infancy? We had it in chapter 1. And verse 5, where Paul says, I am reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded now lives in you also. Right from those young years, his mother and his grandmother taught him the scriptures. They grounded him in the truth of God. And not only did they teach him, but they demonstrated it by their lives. It speaks there in verse 5 of chapter 1 of their sincere faith. As Paul grew up learning the scriptures, he would have looked at their lives, his mother and his grandmother, he would have seen how they lived it out, how it really made a difference to their lives, and uh, that would have been made a, a, a real impression upon him. But then not only in his infancy, but more recently, I think Paul maybe here is also thinking of who has affected uh, and, and taught Timothy recently, and which was, of course, to a large degree himself. Paul himself had had a great impact upon this young Christian Timothy, and he re makes reference to that a few times. Go, again, go back to chapter 1 and verse 13. I can find the verse. What you heard from me keep as the pattern of sound teaching with faith and love in Christ Jesus calls Peter, uh, Timothy to follow his example. Again, in chapter 2 and verse 2, and the things you've heard me say in the presence of many witnesses in trust to reliable people who will also be qualified to teach others. There, we talked about this passing on the baton, and Paul is saying, what you've heard from me, teach to others so that they can go on to teach, and uh, so the baton will be passed on. And... Uh, in uh, chapter the chapter three, the chapter we're looking at, uh, in verse ten, Bill Paul says, "You know, you, however, know all about my teaching, my way of life, my purpose, faith, patience, love, endurance, persecution, sufferings." And he goes on to list what some of those sufferings were. Paul saying there, not only have you heard me teach the word of God, you've seen me live it out in my life. Again, Paul has been a role model to Timothy. So he's had these influences upon his life, people who've not only taught in the scriptures, but authenticated it by the way in which they've lived their lives, role models to him. I wonder as we look back whether there is someone that we, we can recall who not only taught us the word of God, but showed us by their lives how vital it was in their experience and uh, how that, that validated all that they were teaching us. So um, the second, uh, so two reasons why Timothy should continue what he's learned. First, because of those who taught him. But secondly, and this brings us right back to where we started, because the scriptures 
that he has been taught are God breathed. The Bible has God's authority and is therefore the only solid foundation on which we can build our lives. So Paul says to Timothy, you can continue in what you've learned, continue what you've become convinced of because of these things, those who taught you, and for the fact that it is God's word. It's the authority of God's word. So how does the Bible help us to live God's way? Well, firstly, in verse um, 15, it shows us how to be saved from sin. It says, from infancy, you've known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. That's the start point, isn't it? It's through the Scriptures that we come to understand that Jesus went to that cross, died for us. It's through faith in Christ Jesus that we can be saved, that we can begin that journey of faith. And it's the scriptures that teach us that and help us to come to that point of repentance and faith in our lives. But secondly, it shows us how to live the Christian life as we begin that journey. How do we go on to live the Christian life? All scripture, verse 16, is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting and training in righteousness. We're uh, now in a childcare bubble for two of our grandchildren, Freddie, who I mentioned just now, and Henry. And I try and uh, we try and give them a bit of home education as part of that. And uh, I was doing some maths with with Freddie the other day, and um, he he'd been he'd been obviously been taught how to do long division. I think it was by his teacher. He'd had the teaching, and now he, she set him an exercise to show that he understood it. And he did the exercise after a bit of protesting, but he did do it. And um, I had a look at his answers. And yes, he got some of them right, but some of them he got wrong. And so I had to, I, I thought, I can't just let this go. I've got to point out where he's got it wrong. He's not going to learn unless he understands where he's gone wrong. So I had to, in a way, mildly rebuke him, especially where he got one sum correct and then almost the same sort of sum he got wrong. I had to re mildly rebuke him and say, look, Freddie, you know how to do that. You know you shouldn't have done, done that bit there. And this is how to, 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 to do it. So I had to rebuke him. I had to correct him. I had to show him how to put it right, how, how to get the sum to give the correct answer. And then I would set him one or two more sums just to reinforce that, that learning. And I would take a little time to try and explain just what the teacher had already taught him, but just try and explain why and how to do it so that he had a bit more training, direct personal training in how to get these things right. And that's a sort of a simple illustration, but it's how the Bible uh, works for us. Yes, we, it teaches us God's truth, but so often we get things wrong and the Bible shows us when we've got it wrong and it, it, it rebukes us when, we, when we've done it wrong. But it also then shows us how to correct things, how to put things right, what we should be doing. And it gives us that training in righteousness that helps us to go on to try and avoid making those mistakes in the future. Sometimes that comes to us through our own personal Bible study. Sometimes it comes through those that God has given us to teach his word and to, uh, to help us to understand the scriptures better. And finally, why is all this important? Verse 17, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. The Bible is given to us to equip us to serve God. For Timothy, that meant pastoring the church there in Ephesus. So that as he taught them God's truth, they weren't led away by false teachers. And that as issues arose in the church that he had to deal with, he would rebuke sin where it was found in the church, but he would help to put that right by helping through the word of God to correct and to train them in the way of righteousness. And whatever God has called us to do, whatever role he's given us, he's given us the Bible to equip us, to teach us God's truth, sometimes to rebuke us, sometimes to correct us and to train us in the way of righteousness. So as we close this morning, never doubt the authority of God's word. Base your life upon it. Be different 
to those who disregard God's truth. Allow God's word to shape and mold and direct your life. Every part of our lives should be dictated by the Bible. It should be less of what I think and more of what the Bible says. That's how we should live and come under its authority. May God help us to do that. Let's just pray. Father, we confess that uh, uh, so often we allow our own views, our own way of thinking to dominate the behavior in our lives. We pray that you'd help us to realize that the Bible is your breathed out word to us. It is your direct word to us and teaches us how to live our lives. Yes, it rebukes us sometimes when we go wrong, but we thank you that it also corrects us and shows us how to put things right. We thank you there's always that way of repentance and confession to you. Thank you for your forgiveness. Thank you for the blood of the Lord Jesus that was shed to cleanse us from all sin. Lord, we pray that you'd help us to submit to the authority of your word, to let it rule and govern our lives. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.